Okay. Okay, so I, I, I said thank you to the Israeli Privacy Protection Authority to invite me to moderate this panel and to our colleagues from the U.S.-Israel Tech Policy Institute. Um, in the short uh, afternoon hour that we have together, we're going to discuss, discuss uh, policy making, um, law, institutions, and their effect on technology. And the challenge posed to us by the um, drafters of the agenda was how can Israel's uh, powers in tech and entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship be harnessed to drive policies that advance responsible innovation and data use? And they gave us, as you understand, one hour to do that. But we have an outstanding uh, panel here today. Um, I will uh, briefly introduce them and then give a brief overview and ask them each to uh, present their view on this issue. So um, we have uh, Terrell McSweeney, who is a former commissioner of the Federal Trade Commission in the U.S. Prior to joining the commission, uh, Ms. McSweeney served as Chief Counsel for Competition Policy and Intergovernmental Relations for the U.S. Department of Justice Antitrust Division. She joined the Antitrust Division after serving as Deputy Assistant to the President and Domestic <laughs> Policy Advisor to the Vice President from January 2009 until February 2012 advising President Obama and Vice President Biden on policy in a variety of areas, including healthcare, innovation, intellectual property, energy, education, women's rights, criminal justice, and domestic violence. Um, and uh, directly to our left, we have uh, the, I think, former now, yes? Former Deputy Attorney General uh, from the Ministry of Justice, uh, Mr. Avi Licht, who is a seasoned uh, Israeli public civil servant. Avi Licht uh, used to be the Deputy Attorney General for Management and Special Operations, and also he served for seven years as Deputy Attorney General for Economic and Fiscal Matters, where he led processes including reform of corporate legislation, responses to competition and market concentration, the natural gas roadmap, and more. Uh, Licht, who has previously served in the State Attorney's Office as a graduate of the Hebrew University and of the New York University School of Law. And on uh, Avi's left, we have uh, Bruno Gencarelli, Head of International Data Flows and Protection Unit from the European Commission. Mr. Gencarelli heads the International Data Flows and Protection Unit at the European Commission, known as DG Justice and Consumers. In the recent years, he led the Commission's delegation in the interinstitutional negotiations with the European Parliament and the Council that resulted in the adoption of that small little bill that you all have talked about this week and next week and all of the week's coming, which is good, of course, uh, the GDPR. And uh, he was also one of the lead negotiators of the EU-US Privacy Shield and Umbrella Agreement, which is, of course, uh, also super important and fascinating uh, for us. And uh, last but not least, to my left, Professor Jonathan Meyer from Princeton University. He is an assistant professor of computer science and public affairs at Princeton University. Before joining the Princeton faculty, Jonathan served as the technology advisor to the US State Senator Kamala Harris and as Chief Technologist of the Federal Communications Commission Enforcement Bureau. And he is both a computer scientist and a lawyer, having earned a PhD in computer science from Stanford and a JD from Stanford Law School. So, quite impressive. I myself can only speak about uh, too many years in public service uh, doing law and technology, so this is me. And uh, I will uh, open very briefly about um, giving the setup for this discussion. Um, so uh, when we look at uh, the role of the law in, uh, in uh, taming technology, we can think about several models of the law and several models of institutions, and each of our panelists uh, can bring their perspective from their respective country and their respective context. And the, the things that we, we have on the toolbox when we look at policymakers fashioning the legal regime for the 21st century, we can think about administrative and regulatory type laws, such as the GDPR perhaps, or maybe we can think about private law liability rules, um, such as we have in spam or copyright. Um, we can think about uh, rules about uh, more detailed legislation, such as the GDPR, or maybe we can think of a very, very small little clause, which is a very, very powerful, uh, Section 5 of the, uh, the, the FTC Act. And of course, we can think about the right of uh, private action, collective, uh, collective, uh, um, collective uh, court uh, procedures, or we can think about regulatory enforcement procedures. So we have a, a very, very unique toolbox before us, and each of them has um, some fallbacks and drawbacks when we want to design policy and affect the way markets behave. 
So uh, if we sum this uh, uh, to the questions, we ask ourselves from the substantive policy point of view, what should we be requiring businesses to do? And, and from the procedural point of view, what are the mechanisms that we have to enforce those types of mechanisms? And within that, what is the role of the different institutions we have in society in order to translate values of humans uh, to legal rules and their implication on the ground. And we can think about legislators and the way they make these rules. We can think about administrative agencies, uh, such as a, a DPA, or maybe the Federal Trade Commission, or other uh, authorities. We can think about judge-made law. We are a common law system, so we, a, lot, a lot of our rules come from the common law. And when we talk about judge-made law, we can talk about two, two different strands of judge-made law. One could be a constitutional type administrative discussion of rights, and this is uh, the classical role of constitutional courts. And it can also be courts as developing uh, legal norms within uh, the private context uh, as a result of a private claim. And uh, the discussion, of course, is what is the right mix and match of these types of mechanisms when we design policy and when we, from the place I'm sitting, when the country legislates, uh, it has the option to think about what type of institutions it wants to set up, what type of legal rules, and what it expects each of them to do. And uh, the last but not least thing to consider is that uh, this field that we are discussing uh, is unique in the sense that it has no borders. So we need to always think about the interoperability of these types of legal regimes and legal mechanisms so that at the end of the day, uh, we don't stifle innovation and uh, um, the free movement of information and services, which is uh, very important to our economy. So these are the questions at hand, and uh, I'll, uh, I think I'll start with uh, Mr. Gencarelli, if you will, to give your um, views from your point of view about EU law policy and regulation about these types of uh, dilemmas. Thank you. Thank you very much. And first of all, I'm extremely pleased and honored to be here uh, with you today, this afternoon. I will speak in the microphone. Sorry for that. Um, 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 well, a short answer to uh, your long question. We, knew, we need all of what you've mentioned. Uh, I think that uh, uh, we all realize, and the previous panel was uh, extremely interesting because we also realize how much common ground there is with uh, uh, between the EU and Israel on these issues. But we all realize that uh, privacy uh, is a serious thing. Uh, having uh, rules and having strong enforcement is uh, not a luxury, but a necessity, also in light of, of scandals that shows that uh, this is not only a question of uh, individual rights, this is also a question that concerns the society as a whole, including the functioning of a democratic process. Uh, this is also an economic necessity. Uh, uh, because we need that uh, trust uh, in, our, uh, in our increasingly data-driven and data-incentive economy. So we need rules, we need a clear framework um, uh, which uh, uh, can deliver uh, the trust and the legal certainty both businesses and citizens demand and, and deserve. Uh, we need uh, uh, credible enforcement uh, because we need to, those rules to have some, some, some teeth. Uh, self-regulation. Uh, I know there are uh, some that are still uh, hoping that all of this can be resolved of uh, self-regulation. Uh, uh, self-regulation is certainly not sufficient to uh, uh, address the challenges we, we, we are talking uh, in this panel as in the previous panel and in the, in the, in the next pa panels. Uh, core regulatory tools can be useful to help companies uh, uh, managing uh, compliance and uh, helping them in in, in, in complying, but the, the uh, uh, self-regulation is having not sufficient. But at the same time, we need those, those rules and those legislative framework uh, to be horizontal. Sectorial rules uh, are no longer adapted uh, to a, uh, an era where data needs to flow, needs to flow across industries, across sector, between the private and the public sector. We are in a university, research needs that. Uh, across business models, also across borders, and I know we will talk about um, about interoperability. So an overarching legislation, but which is, and that's where the other tools you have mentioned uh, uh, have to uh, enter into play, which is uh, technological neutral, which is sufficiently uh, flexible, uh, which leaves flexibility and margin to companies on how, uh, uh, regarding how 
uh, uh, they, uh, uh, um, uh, the tools they use to, 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 to fulfill uh, their uh, obligations. So that's essentially what we have tried to do uh, uh, with uh, the uh, 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 GDPR and again we see a lot of commonality with uh, what uh, has been done here and is also because that's important uh, there are uh, the, 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 the certain uh, new rules in the, in the pipeline in Israel but uh, importance of accountability importance of having a system which is uh, not a uh, one size fits it all uh, a system but which uh, uh, graduates, which uh, adapts uh, obligations uh, uh, in light of the risk of the processing, so the risk-based approach, uh, which as we have heard this uh, uh, in the uh, in the previous uh, in the previous uh, uh, panel, uh, is very important uh, because also in terms of uh, having. Uh, a balance and not uh, excessive uh, regulatory burden, but also as, as, as a very important incentive for innovation. Uh, because if, you, if, you, if you develop, and uh, again we have heard uh, interesting examples, if you develop uh, privacy enhancing technology, uh, technologies or application, then you reduce the level of risk and you're rewarded uh, through uh, 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 reduced, uh, uh, reduced obligation, reduced regulatory burden. So that's something else that the we believe that a very important aspect of the GDPR, which, al which, was always, uh, which is often forgotten, that we have moved to a one-size-fits-all uh, system in which all obligations apply to any type of processing to a system which is, much, which is based on scalability and which is more, much more uh, flexible and, and graduated. Uh, and the final thing, and that's, I'm, I'm happy to mention that too, because we have heard uh, that the data protection or the regulator in, in Israel not only has changed name, but is in, uh, as our uh, uh, data protection authorities in Europe is, 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 is going through a number of, of changes, uh, uh, we need, uh, we need a strong uh, 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 regulator. And again, not only for question of enforcement, of course enforcement is important, and there's no data protection law as there's any uh, without uh, 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 credible enforcement. Uh, but because, precisely because we need to keep that data protection legislative framework uh, technological neutral, uh, future proof, it has to, of course, uh, 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 keep a certain degree of generality and it is the role of uh, data protection authorities to adapt uh, uh, the application, the interpretation, the implementation of uh, those uh, of, of those rules to, of course, a fast evolving uh, uh, environment to uh, new technological developments, new commercial developments. So that's uh, 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 another aspect that I've seen, you've seen developing in Europe very much uh, uh, and which, continue to, which will continue to develop is, is, this, is, is this role uh, of uh, data protection authorities in providing guidance uh, and following, and of course based, and that's also an important, I would say, cultural innovation that we are in, based on a, a very, uh, I would say, rich uh, dialogue uh, with stakeholders, across the whole range of stakeholders. Uh, uh, as you've seen, uh, the guidelines of the Article 29 Working Party, which is a body that brings together all our uh, data protection authorities, which now has been also renamed European Data Protection Board, uh, were always uh, uh, sub sub subject to, to consultation. So those are, 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 are some elements, sorry, I've probably been already too long, uh, and I've apologized with my co panelists but those are some elements uh, that you, you that you see in our system and that will will uh, in a certain sense uh, uh, we are also learning uh, since the 25th of May uh, we all survived the sky didn't fall but uh, we uh, uh, we uh, uh, that will 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 continue to we, we believe we, we will continue to uh, uh, to develop and that are uh, as I say extremely important beyond even uh, uh, the content of, of the GDPR. Thank you. Um, Commissioner McSweeney, I think uh, this is the right time to turn to you and ask you about the situation across the Atlantic, because in the US there is no general data protection regulation, detailed such as uh, just described. Does this put uh, too much pressure on the FTC to promote policy, and how do you see the um, road ahead? Well, uh, is this on? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to join you today. I was recently a commissioner at the U.S. Federal Trade Commissioner, but now I'm uh, 
independent and unemployed former regulator, which means I don't have to even disclaim what, yeah, what I'm going to say. I'm just going to give you my, my point of view, and it's uh, take it for what it is. It's worth nothing. Um, so, uh, you know, I will say, first of all, I think it's, I, I still will defend the fact that it is a misconception that the U.S. is a regulatory free space when it comes to privacy and data. I do think we have a sector-based approach, and what I mean by that is that it's an approach that's grounded um, based on the industry and the type of data that is being handled. For example, we have specific laws around student data, those actually vary by state, uh, health data, financial data, children's data under for children under 13, and some other examples. So. Uh, telecommunications data, video rental history, that's an important one. <laughs> um, so we have, we have some laws. Uh, but you're right that the U.S. Federal Trade Commission has emerged over the last 25 years as a sort of generalist data protection authority for the U.S. government at the federal level. And it's done that using an authority that's almost, uh, well, a little more than 100 years old to protect consumers from unfair, deceptive acts and practices, a so-called Section 5 authority that we are, that we are commonly referred to uh, as having. And, and just for those that don't cover the ins and outs of all of the evolution of that doctrine, I'm going to give a brief Cliff Notes history of it to say that uh, it starts with the FTC being very concerned that on this thing called the World Wide Web that some consumers were getting on, mostly through a portal called AOL that Jules worked at. Uh, that uh, Recently, I was, by the way, on a panel uh, it was at an event with Steve Case, and he said when he started AOL, uh, consumers, a uh, tiny percent were on the internet and they were only on it for an hour a week. So just imagine that. That was 1989, okay? Um, so the, the FTC at the same time is looking at what's happening to consumers and it says, you know what, um, we need to make sure that people aren't harmed by the deceptive use of their information online. So everybody's got to have a privacy policy so that the people who get on the website know what is happening to their information once they get on there so that they're not deceived. That's that use of that deception authority. Well, um, that's cool. And what happened uh, fast forward was that now everybody has a really long privacy policy that no one reads. Mission accomplished. Um, but uh, what's important, of course, about those privacy policy documents is that they are governing documents for the organizations that are using them. So I think they're still very valid. So I'm being a little bit flippant, but I think that they, they serve an important role in the ecosystem. That said, the FTC itself recognized that, in fact, most people weren't able to meaningfully interact with those documents and make choices. So it started focusing, and the modern FTC focuses on, providing consumers with real-time, clear notices and choices uh, that are opt-in choices when their sensitive information is going to be collected and used. And sensitive information in this case includes many of those categories of information I just mentioned as sector-based, so healthcare, financial, information of children under 13. But also includes geolocation, social security number, content of communications. So I, I could keep going on the history of this. I think one of the ad advantages of the FTC approach has been that over time, and I, and I guess I should add here as well that, of course, in the United States, the state attorney generals have similarly pursued under their own authorities to protect consumers from unfair deceptive acts and practices some very important cases as well. So the FTC has brought about, all told, about 500 cases involving privacy practices since the time it started. These include also abuses of our do not call registry, which is a uh, registry to protect your telephone number from unwanted telecommunications and sales calls. It uh, has focused on and has been able to focus on changing practices in the industry, and I think this is important. In recent cases, especially looking at clever technical workarounds for asserted consumer privacy choices. So in, in Mobi, for example, if a consumer has opted not to share their uh, privacy, their location with an app, then you cannot still gather that location by triangulating their Wi-Fi. Uh, so that looking at that practice, um, it has looked at the clarity of uh, choices and consents, most recently in the IoT space in a case involving Vizio, which was smart televisions, and also in the apps, payment app space in a case involving Venmo. 
but it hasn't aggressively used its unfairness authority, which is its authority to uh, really go after use cases that might be harmful. Now, it has in some cases, uh, so for example, in the data security cases, the FTC has been focused on using that authority, and it has used it in uh, very extreme examples of harm, such as revenge porn cases, but it hasn't uh, pushed too far into the use category, and I think that that's probably wise and judicious of the FTC, but that use remains an area where we're all having very meaningful conversation about what is the right government response to that. So pros of the, of the US approach, I think, would be that it keeps pace with a dynamic, dynamic space. Um, it is, I think, arguably very pro-innovative in that it doesn't overly burden new uses of data and allows for a lot of entry. It's harm-focused, so it's looking at the harms to consumers about, uh, about the use of their information. Cons of the U.S. approach, of course, not a rights-based framework, so people don't have rights to their data, and I think this is a big con in my, in my view and a real strength of the European approach. It is reactive, it's inherently reactive because it's based mostly on ex post enforcement. It is uh, perhaps too reliant on end users to ad adequately anticipate the risks of sharing their data, and more importantly, in our very connected digital world in the fourth industrial revolution, not just the consequence to the individual of sharing their data, but the collective consequence of that sharing. And it may be arguably, at times, relatively unclear for industry to follow. I don't want to take too much time. I'll just say that um, right now in the U.S., we are having a very active and lively conversation about uh, whether the U.S. framework as it currently exists is adequate for the digital age. I think that it is fair to say that trust, which is really so essential for self-regulation and the trust us model that has been the dominant view of internet policy making in the U.S. has been badly frayed by, by the consequences of the way tech has been uh, weaponized in many um, democratic processes and a lot of the recent revelations around the role technology is playing. And I think it's right to inquire about the, whether this model is really sufficient given the complexities of our modern life. I, I personally believe that in the U.S. there's likely going to be a movement to give U.S. users more rights and control over their data, which I think would be very helpful, that uh, transparency, fairness, security, integrity, and control are going to uh, continue to be essential values that are reflected in our framework. But I also hope that portability and interoperability and, and openness remain uh, in the forefront and also are embraced in the U.S. in a meaningful way. Because I, I really personally believe that it's important not to overcompensate on privacy. Yes, privacy is absolutely essential for many things in democracy and is essential for liberty. But when we're talking about a lot of the problems that we're talking about, we're talking about problems that go, in my view, beyond the scope of privacy, such as a weaponization of information at scale and platform power. And so I, as we think about right-sizing consumer rights and frameworks for the digital age, what I hope we really remain focused on is privacy and security, but also access to a free and open internet that is a truly decentralized platform that will allow anyone to connect to it, as opposed to an internet of walled gardens in which we are locked in and sort of beholden to the owners of those spaces. So I'll stop there. Thank you, that was uh, comprehensive and I think it gave us a, a good uh, picture of issues from the US and now I would like to turn to Avi and ask you to take us to the Israeli scene. Um, what type of uh, regulatory mechanisms do you think are relevant for Israeli technology for the 21st century? The EU type regulatory legal model, we heard about the importance of the DPA, the US ex post enforcement model. Um. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I want to share with you the fact that I'm terrified because I don't have much uh, chances to speak in English, so I wrote it all down, so please be patient, okay? Uh, uh, first of all, I want to thank Professor Tene for inviting me to this important session. I also want to welcome our distinguished guests. Uh, as, <clears throat> as Amit said, until a few weeks ago, and for nine period of that, uh, I served as a deputy attorney general. Uh, during that time, 
Uh, it was a privilege to me to be a part of a team responsible to the development of uh, new uh, regulatory policies in Israel. I will not speak about data protection, uh, but from a strategic, strategic point of view with the regulator. Uh, in my last uh, year in office, I tried, uh, with no actual success, uh, to close the gaps between the old school regulation and uh, the ever-changing high-tech industries in what uh, is proudly called in Israel startup nation. Uh, I called my effort startup regulation. Uh, we must be honest and admit that uh, for too many years the Israeli public sector and the Israeli high-tech industries existed uh, in parallel worlds with uh, little contact between them. Uh, I can think of uh, two reasons for uh, the existence of uh, these parallel worlds. Uh, lack of interest on the part of uh, the industry on the one hand and uh, unresponsive Israeli bureaucracy uh, on the other. However, in recent years, we have seen a rapid change in uh, the attitude uh, towards regulation. Uh, the parallel worlds are uh, getting closer and closer. Uh, the regulator woke up from uh, the romantic approach or uh, lazy approach of not seeing a need for uh, regulating industries created by uh, technologi technological ad uh, advances. Uh, in Israel, we don't mess with the internet. Uh, and on the same time, uh, the high-tech industries started to develop business models that uh, produce goods and services that touch on economic sector that are traditionally heavily regulated sectors such as finance and transportation. Uh, this convergence of uh, new high-tech business models with traditionally regulated economic sector gives regulatory policy in Israel a potentially new role, not as an obstacle or a burden, but uh, rather as an engine or a solid base for growth. Uh, I'm not talking about developing uh, special tax regi regimes or exemptions from current regulation. Uh, this is already obvious. Uh, the startup regulation uh, that I'm talking about will create long-term business certainty and stability by setting clear rules in advance. It will restore legitimacy for companies operating in business fields that have become uh, discredited due to the illegal or borderline actions of a few bad actors. The new regulation can also act internationally by using the state power uh, in influence abroad in order to uh, create standards that will uh, benefit the local uh, players in Israel. For startup regulation to make a positive economic contribution, it must follow several guidelines. First of all, it must be technologically neutral. It must focus on new fields, but with already existing ecosystems. We should give the startups to lead us in choosing the fields. Cutting edge regulation must be capable of being developed quickly, and once implemented, it must be easily adjustable. It can be allowed to become, uh, uh, it can be allowed to become frozen and irrelevant. It must be comprehensive regulation that will regulate all relevant aspects of an industry and be developed jointly with the industry under one coherent agenda. The modern regulator needs to be <clears throat> courageous and willing to take calculated risk. In short, the new regulator should, be, should, be, uh, should act like a surfer on the beaches of Tel Aviv. The surfer does not create the waves. However, a good surfer knows which wave is the best. He knows to track it from a distance and to jump in at the exact right moment. Jumping too soon or too late won't, be, won't capture the wave's momentum. Here in Israel, we have the right condition for choosing the best waves. We have the knowledge uh, to predict the coming waves of technology. We will know how, if we will know how to use the knowledge to understand the needs of the market and to adjust regulation properly, we'll, we'll, we will gain leading international role, not only in high tech, but also in regulation. This role can attract investors, it will create new products for the local markets and will help Israel to be influential player in the development of evolving global standards. If someone were to ask me about the next technological waves uh, that we <coughs> should surf on in Israeli horizon, I would say two fields. 
autonomous vehicles, AV technology, and blockchain technologies, and particularly cryptocurrencies. Both of these fields are in a desperate need of regulation, and both are already part of a vibrant ecosystem in Israel. Both of these fields operate in heavily regulated industries with zero tolerance. The, technological, the technologies are already here, but unfortunately, the needed regulation is not yet here. For example, in the AV sector, the real issues are tort law, insurance and responsibility, and who will regulate the uh, algorithm and how, what we call robotic uh, regulation. In blockchain technologies, the regulators are still confused and someone needs to help the legitimate players to throw out the charlatans for the good of the industry. As I mentioned uh, before, creating cutting-edge regulation needs to be an interministerial, government-wide effort with industry uh, actively involved in all stages. Regulators cannot continue uh, <clears throat> the work of a separate regulators operating independently of each other and in the dark about each other. New regulation must be a broad and comprehensive effort of government and industry working together. The potential is unlimited. Thank you. Um, so, some of you recalled new public management, and others recalled surfing the beaches of California. So, I think Tel Aviv. Uh, Tel Aviv. Uh, well, I, I thought about California. <laughs> <laughs> about uh, um, so, Professor Meyer, give us your view about uh, the challenges for this new regulation, regulatory vision, and its uh, application. Sure. Um, so, uh, I'd like to touch on three issues in. Um, the prepared part. Uh, the first, uh, 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 some brief notes on where Congress seems to be going, picking up where uh, Terrell left off. Um, then I want to talk briefly about the broader ecosystem of voices uh, on technology policy in the U.S. and what some lessons might be for Israel. Um, uh, and then last, uh, I want to speak to an issue that's popped up a few times already today, um, that of uh, regulating and legislating in this space um, that's so inherently technical when legislators and regulators might not have the greatest uh, access to technical expertise. So let me start with uh, what's going on in Congress. Um, uh, I was serving in Congress until about three months ago. Um, so I had a, a chance to see firsthand the, the evolution that's taking place. And it's very clear that there is a radical shift right now in the relationship between the U.S. Congress and at least the American technology sector. Um, for well over a decade, the tech sector in the United States um, was untouchable on Capitol Hill. Um, it was the poster child for American innovation and ingenuity. Um, it was a booming sector of our economy. Um, and it was also just really cool. Uh, and. Uh, every major attempt to legislate new requirements for the technology sector, not just in privacy but across the board, failed. Uh, and failed spectacularly. Um, so let me give a few examples of that. Um, there was an attempt at cybersecurity legislation in 2012 uh, that got watered down again and again and again to the point where it was a set of voluntary best practices for cybersecurity, and even that couldn't get through Congress. Um, in 2011 and 2012, there's some legislation you may have heard of called SOPA and PIPA. Um, there's intellectual property uh, legislation that would have required the tech sector to remove certain content um, uh, uh, from the internet. Um, and that failed spectacularly, um, leading to like online riots, essentially. Um, uh, uh, legislation on rigorous new privacy requirements um, was uh, occasionally popped up on the Democratic side of the aisle. Um, um, but that didn't have sort of unanimous support, and um, under the Obama administration, what the administration proposed was you know, certainly not at the level of rigor of, say, the GDPR. Um, uh, and in fact, when Congress did take action related to tech, it tended to be just to the industry's benefit. So, for example, in 2015, there was a cybersecurity bill that became law that was just a liability shield for industry. Right? It was, it, it was uh, clearly solely to industry's benefit. Um, everyone involved in the debate and the implementation of that law recognized that fact. Um, so uh, that was the relationship then. Um, but just in the time I was serving in the Congress, um, it became clear the, the relationship was shifting, uh, as, as I mentioned, radically. 
Um, some of that's because of the re recurring high-profile scandals we've already talked about. Um, some of that's because of perspective that the, the technology sector leans left and the political winds are blowing differently in Washington. Some of that's because of shifting public perspectives. There are a bunch of reasons, but the, the result is clear. Um, and let me give a few examples of that result. Uh, one is um, intermediary liability protections that had gone untouched for decades. They've been under assault for decades, but gone untouched. Um, the tech sector thought they'd be able to hold the line like they always could. Um, they totally lost. Right? So they, they wanted to keep in place the liability protections they'd had. They thought that was going to be the outcome. In fact, they wound up getting um, a, 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 a new carve out from those liability protections that was pretty much the exact thing they had been lobbying against for decades. Um, all of a sudden it just changed. Um, uh, another example, we've talked about pol political advertising transparency. Um, uh, there was legislation that uh, members from both sides of the aisle were pushing. That suddenly became the voluntary practice among a bunch of the tech companies because they could read the political tea leaves. They were going to lose that fight if they made it a fight. Um, uh, and now on privacy, we have folks like John Kennedy from Louisiana telling Mark Zuckerberg, your user agreement sucks. Right? This is like a, you know, a, 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 a red state senator, right? Louisiana Republican, <laughs> hinting he's okay with regulation. Um, so th there's this new status quo. that We've got broad and bipartisan agreement in Congress that there are huge problems in the tech sector and that we maybe need regulation to address those problems. Um, what there isn't yet bipartisan consensus on is what specifically to do about it. Um, and so I think in, in a bit of future casting, it's very clear that something's going to happen. It's become a uh, what, not if, um, and when, not if. Um, uh, and whether that's you know, because uh, there's, there's a political shift or suddenly there's new middle, or there's new middle ground on, on this issue, um, uh, hard to say, but it's, it's going to happen. Okay. So that's the first topic I wanted to touch on. The second is the ecosystem of voices around tech policy um, in DC. And I just want to flag that, at least in the States, it's deeply dysfunctional. Um, I, I recently um, uh, uh, had a chance to work quite closely with um, uh, 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 trade associations, tech civil society groups, and academics in, in regulatory and legislative roles. Um, and it's really clear that trade associations can be super effective. They show up. They understand the norms and speak the language of government institutions. They bring new policy perspectives and facts. Um, they make very actionable requests. Uh, civil society groups, by contrast, especially on privacy issues, um, rarely show up. They repeat uh, well-worn and often obvious talking points. Um, and they're framed from their viewpoint. They're not really actionable from the regulator or legislative uh, standpoint. So, for example, the FCC. I just didn't need to hear from another civil society group that like telecoms learn a lot about their customers. Like news at 11. Um, uh, or at the Senate, we were, we were looking at um, renewing a, a part of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. I just didn't need another NGO to show up and tell me, like, um, spying is spooky. Like, also old, old news uh, for, from that perspective. Um, and then as for academics having impact in Washington, D.C., I don't think I need to say more about that. Um, so, um, actually, one example of that, uh, there were a bunch of fancy academics, top institutions, some of them were like literally folks who invented the internet, very concerned about an issue with the FCC. Um, they wanted a, the FCC to do something, they filed their, um, their views on the matter in the wrong docket. It's just a classic example of these smart folks trying to influence government, they put the paperwork in the wrong place, no one paid any attention to it. Um, so, I think a challenge in the U.S. that hopefully Israel could do better on uh, by virtue of, of its uh, burgeoning startup ecosystem is uh, building a better and more representative ecosystem, not uh, uh, of tech policy voices uh, outside of industry specifically. Uh, the last point I wanted to touch on is legislating and regulating in the tech space without adequate technical expertise. Um, uh, it's a topic that's come up several times today. Um, certainly it was very clear uh, in Congress's abysmal performance in the Zuckerberg hearings. Um, um, and to, to give a few sort of, uh, a couple extra data points on this. So at the FCC, the FCC was responsible, at least at the time, for internet infrastructure. And when I was there, there were maybe half a dozen people at the FCC who seriously understood how the internet works. Um, uh, in the Senate, um, in the time I was there, I was one of two computer scientists on the entire United States Senate staff. Um, 
Uh, and so as a result, unsurprisingly, the FCC was not very comfortable um, leaning into regulation of the internet infrastructure, and the Senate is very uncomfortable developing policy in this area. The FTC actually is in pretty good shape. Just a shout out there, really bright <laughs> point um, in, in, uh, on this. Um, and I, I think it's, the, the situation is, is really bad. It's important to understand from, from two directions. There's a demand problem. So there's a gro uh, growing interest from legislators and regulators in bringing in tech expertise, but very little action on that. Um, there, there haven't been recruiting pushes. There aren't career pathways getting built out. Um, there, there isn't appropriate seniority for bringing people in uh, to the government to do tech work. Um, there's a tendency to view non-career staffers in the government with some skepticism. Uh, one of my favorite terms I, I heard um, was uh, uh, like fellows who come in. They're like the Christmas help. Like they come in and do stuff, but then they're gone, and the, the, the lifetime staffers will remain. I guess we call that the deep state now. Um, uh, so there's this demand problem, and then there's a supply problem of, uh, again, growing interest from talented technologists and working in the government, um, but also little action. Um, and a, a lot of that is because folks aren't willing to press pause on their careers, um, uh, move across the country, take a huge pay cut, uh, just to work in a low-level government job with few of their peers. Um, and so um, something that the U.S. has to do a much better job about, and I think Israel, again, is, is in a much better, it, uh, it could be much better positioned uh, to, to do is build out that pipeline from uh, outside technical expertise into the government. So thank you so much. Uh, uh, we, we, can, uh, we need to thank Bruno because he yeah. needs to leave. So thank yeah. you, Bruno, for joining us. Maybe a, a we still say something on interoperability. Yes, we, we, <laughs> yes, we, we I, 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 So I, can I just ask a yes. specific question? Because wh what we see here is the need for discourse between uh, technologists and policy people and the industry and how do you see it from your point of view um, in this area or in implementation of these issues? So I'm, I'm very sorry, I have to leave because I, am, I have to participate in the event and this panel has been delayed. Uh, so we'll f I will do something that n nobody should ever do. I will uh, choose the question I want to answer. To. <laughs> so, uh, Why didn't you say so and, before? It's and exactly. Uh, you know, we are in Israel, we are in the Mediterranean, exactly. So. Um, um, in on uh, now, I think there was a point on interoperability. That is, uh, how, how, you know, uh, how can interoperability be promoted? Well, interoperability is happening. Is happening right now. I think my previous uh, colleagues from the Commission who took the floor uh, uh, talked about it. Uh, just if we see what has happened in the last days, uh, Chile adopted a constitutional law which introduced the uh, right to uh, data protection in the constitution as a fundamental right. Brazil adopted uh, uh, first reading, it now has to go to the Senate, uh, first ever overarching data protection law which also creates, and you can imagine the challenges for a country like Brazil, a data protection authority. India released today a uh, sort of draft law which with some uh, specificities but uh, uh, is, uh, is certainly uh, presents some signs of convergence. And what is interesting about that convergence that we are saying, we are seeing, sorry, that it is based increasingly based on common elements, the elements that the Israeli sector, the Israeli uh, system shares and, and uh, we shared and many other countries share. And that's not because GDPR imperialism or because people on all of a sudden fall in love with Europe um, or with the GDPR, but because you are, we are facing uh, increasingly the same uh, challenges and trying to seize the same opportunities and there are no thousand different ways to do that. Uh, and what I was saying, what we are saying, what are those elements of, of commonalities we're saying? An overarching legislation, an independent uh, supervisor, a uh, common set, a core set of uh, uh, safeguards and enforceable rules. For us, this is very interesting uh, because, and I will then say something also on Israeli adequacy, as I know it's some, something was already said this morning, but this is very interesting because uh, this is the way to build and to develop what, what we could call hard convergence. So convergence which is based on uh, 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 laws, domestic laws, domestic institution, uh, uh, strong, uh, strong enforcement, uh, independent supervision. Uh, at a time where at the, uh, data flows are, of course, of uh, 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 great importance, but those issues are also subject, and not only in Europe, to greater scrutiny, judicial scrutiny, political scrutiny, that's the way, that's the way forward. I would say, to have uh, 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 that type of hard law convergence or, or, or uh, yes, hard convergence uh, for viable, long-lasting solution for, for international transfers. Uh, 
Um, and that also can deliver that, that, that legal certainty that uh, 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 stakeholders are, are demanding. Uh, very briefly on, Israeli on the Israel adequacy. Uh, as it has been explained by, 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 by my colleague this morning, uh, we are reviewing all existing uh, adequacy decisions. There is no sunset clause in the GDPR. The, the adequacy decision that were adopted on the directive uh, will continue to apply under the regulation until, says the regulation, amended, uh, withdrawn, or uh, otherwise changed. Um, at the same time, uh, as any finding, a finding is made at a certain point of time, and the system which is found adequate, but also our system, uh, uh, can evolve in the course of time. So that, that's why we need to update our finding and make sure that that finding can uh, continue to be valid. That's why we, are, we have done, uh, uh, we, are, we have entered into a review exercise with the, I would put the privacy shield aside because there's an annual review every year, but with the 11 other countries or territories uh, which have benefited from an adequacy decision under the uh, directive, which is the instrument that was there before the GDPR, we are es essentially asking uh, those country and territories two important questions. What has happened since we have found them adequate? Some adequacy, think of Canada, is from 2000, so a number of years have, have passed. So, happened in terms of changes to the privacy laws, enforcement, uh, activity of their regulators, and then also something we didn't assess at that time, but which has become a core part, which has become a core part of our assessment. What are the rules that applies in case a government needs to access data? So, in a scenario where uh, data is transferred, for instance, from the EU to Israel for commercial reasons. It can, of course, once it has landed in Israel, be accessed by public authorities, uh, law enforcement authorities, national se uh, security authorities for very legitimate reasons, but we need to follow, the, I would say, almost the life cycle of the data to make sure that certain safeguards exist in that case too. This is a complex, you can imagine, conversation with Israel, but with all the other uh, countries uh, concerned, but it is an essential. Uh, it's an essential condition to ensure the, the, the viability of our adequacy decision. Um, we have a very uh, good and uh, rich dialogue with our Israeli counterparts, uh, which is not yet finished, which is going on right now, um, uh, because we will have to report to the Parliament and to uh, uh, the European Council, which is our member states, at the latest on in uh, uh, 2020 on uh, our existing adequacy findings. Uh, therefore, it's that, that dialogue is essential. This is an essential part of our relationship uh, uh, with Israel, and we, we are working very hard on this. A very last uh, word, because I, I, I heard, I, I know I was not here this morning, but I know that that was mentioned, and it's often mentioned. With the GDPR, uh, the relevance of adequacy has significantly decreased. Yes and no. Yes, in a certain sense, because we have extended the scope of our uh, rules, so mechanically when you extend the scope, the direct, the direct application of something like the GDPR, it mechanically reduces some of the space uh, that, were, uh, uh, that, were, that was before covered by international transfer tools such as adequacy. But at the same time, we need that adequacy decision. Uh, as we all know, uh, processing today is increasingly subject to uh, uh, long, complex processing chain with many actors. F not all of these actors are captured directly by the GDPR. To be, there's a lot of misunderstanding on uh, the scope of the GDPR, on the famous Article 3. Uh, basically, to be captured by the GDPR, you need to be EU consumer facing. A lot of actors uh, that intervene in a processing chain are not. This will be clarified, you have heard, there will be guidance, and I, I can already tell you that those guidance will be. be very specific on the scope of the GDPR based on scenarios, question, answers, uh, that will certainly help. But still, uh, uh, there is, uh, uh, um, uh, there is a, a significant uh, added uh, value and a lot of interest in keeping that adequacy uh, uh, decision, uh, which uh, uh, fully uh, play its role in uh, uh, allowing uh, data uh, transfers uh, without subjecting them to any additional conditional requirement, which therefore is an essential uh, support to uh, uh, exchanges, uh, trade exchanges, commercial exchanges, but also cooperation uh, between uh, public authorities. So I don't want to be neither optimistic or pessimistic on this. Uh, we are working hard. We on both sides realize uh, how much uh, uh, this is important. 
and uh, 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 we will uh, certainly even work uh, harder and more intensively in the coming month. Last, last word, Convention 108 of the Council of Europe. Uh, when we are talking about convergence, that's where that convergence is reflected. It's a convention of the Council of Europe, uh, uh, which is a European institution, but uh, some of its conventions, like the Cyber Security Convention, are, all, are of universal nature, they're open uh, to uh, countries around the world. Uh, and what we say in this, on what we are seeing with this Convention 108 on data protection is that you have increasingly universal membership from Latin America, uh, Africa, uh, Asia. And I'm very happy that uh, Israel has decided to become an observer to that convention. Uh, we hope that Israel will join that convention. Israel is already uh, party to the other uh, universal uh, uh, convention of the Council of Europe, which is the Cyber Security Convention. We believe that data protection and cyber security are the two legs that you need uh, those two legs uh, to walk or to swim in the, in, in the, in the, uh, on, the on Tel Aviv shores or in, other, uh, in any ki kind of other ocean uh, or navigate. I don't know, we can continue with this type of uh, image. This is very important because that convention is not only a piece of paper, an important piece of paper, but it's also a fora, a fora where increasingly standards are elaborated, are developed on the basis of best practice, on the basis of guidance, uh, from health to law enforcement. So having uh, uh, the Israeli voice in that context is, 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 uh, is absolutely uh, uh, important and uh, we will certainly uh, support uh, 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 in case uh, there is an application of Israel to join the convention, we will, we, will, we will support it. So thank you very much and uh, see you soon here or in other places around the world, uh, on the beach, uh, in California or in Tel Aviv. Thank you. So, so, so uh, I think uh, we'll, uh, after these uh, strong words, uh, an optimistic word, uh, we'll sum up. I think that we've heard uh, today about the... Carefully optimistic. Sorry? <laughs> Carefully optimistic word. I think that uh, for my line of work presently, I think that the analogy between uh, the Council of Europe uh, 185 co uh, Convention and uh, 108, which is, by the way, cybercrime, it's not cybersecurity, is interesting because there the Council of Europe built substantive rules, procedural rules, and institutional mechanisms for cooperation. And we heard from uh, Mr. Gancarelli that this may be a model for data protection. This is something to think about from the interoperability point of view. We've heard about uh, the, rules, the role of legislation, both in the U.S., and in the EU, and I guess also in Israel, to create rights for citizens. And we heard about the right, uh, the importance of institutions. We heard from uh, Avi about uh, the, the role of uh, energizing, I guess, uh, the regulators to do their work uh, better and more efficiently. We don't have time for a follow-up question uh, more specifically, but uh, I'll leave that to you in the coffee break or to your future uh, newspaper uh, interviews. Anyhow, and uh, last but not least, some behind the scenes from the U.S. Congress, which were quite uh, interesting. And I have to tell you, not completely different from what we experience in local parliamentary procedures. And uh, in Israel, I can tell you that some of the people doing uh, law and policy for a long time don't have a computer degree even, but they get away with it. Anyhow, so um, thank you very much for your attention, and I hope you have some uh, key takeaways for academic and policy work in the future. Thank you, Omer, Jules, the Privacy Protection Forum.